you, but you can see me now, which is a little intimidating. Um, and David, I did want to say before that not only <laughs> is it amazing that Spender's wife didn't represent him as a villain, she also uh, didn't represent him as a victim, which I think is particularly <laughs> amazing, given the longevity of their relationship. Anyway, so obviously the relationship between history and literature is incredibly complicated, um, even though I think culturally we tend to think of the disciplines in quite opposing terms, that history is a, um, a matter of facts, a, a gathering of evidence, um, of different evidence types, whereas literature, of course, is a, a product of the imagination. It's, it belongs to the realm of fantasy. But, of course, we know, and, and as Malati and David have talked about so well already, that um, each are profoundly interconnected and each are reliant on the tropes of storytelling, as I think David's presentation made so clear, um, including character and setting and plot, and each is reliant as well on persuading a reader of the truth or the reality of what they are describing. So in literary studies, we, we insist on acknowledging the ways in which a text does not occur in a vacuum, but is the result of so many intersecting factors, social, political, cultural, medical, biological, historical, of course, um, the poetry, fiction, memoir, essays, they all emerge from very particular times and very particular places. Something that I'm particularly interested in is the ways in which literature can speak to historical events um, in, in ways that can reveal the unspoken and how through literature we can gain access not only to moments in time, but also start to understand how those moments become embedded in our cultural imagination. How we're able to experience, of course, in a mediated way, versions of the past through literary works. Um, and though we have to be careful, I think, always to separate what we know in historical terms versus what we embellish through the imagination or fantasy, and we know that writers are, are obviously very prone to doing that. So to ground these ideas a little more, I'd like to speak a bit about the poetry emerging from Chernobyl, written by both survivors of the nuclear disaster and inspired by witness testimonies of the event. Chernobyl has become a shorthand way of describing the explosion of a nuclear reactor at the power station in Pripyat in Ukraine on April 26, 1986. The event is often understood in terms of a peculiar binary. There is the very real and very material aftermath of the explosion, including the deaths of the first responders, the evacuation of the town, the poisoning of the community and the landscape, and the efforts to contain the affected area. But it's also marked by censorship, silence and uncertainty because so much factual information about Chernobyl, about the causes and its impacts, have been buried, both literally and metaphorically. So the precarity of the zone of exclusion, which is what the area where the explosion occurred is called, remains quite uncertain, as does the ongoing danger posed by the concrete sarcophagus that covers the damaged reactor. So Gocher and, and Brunston observed that the causal links to specific illnesses are unclear, they're unprovable, and they're attenuated by poverty and material struggle amongst many of the people most affected. And as a result, most of the effects of the hazard are not fully understood by science, and nor do they seem to be precisely fixed or stable, which produces this really interesting series of ambiguities that evade the senses and descriptive language. So even though the aftermath of Chernobyl is so physically obvious, um, it's also shrouded in mystery and this persistent anxiety about the long-term consequences of exposure to radiation. It was really interesting to note a few days ago, for example, that there was an article in Japan Today that the families of atomic bomb survivors, the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, are currently undergoing DNA testing to see if the impacts of nuclear explosions are still occurring in the bodies of their children, their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren. So there's so much about nuclear disaster that remains unknown. And because of this, there's a tendency to mythologise in order to compensate for this kind of mystery. And of course, there's nothing like a sense of the mysterious to motivate writers and creators, again, as David's presentation highlighted so beautifully. <laughs> 
So perhaps because of its opacity, and I'm a slide ahead of myself, but that's okay, Chernobyl um, has been inspiration for an enormous number of texts across genres that grapple with the unimaginable, including poetry, but also including prose fiction, essays, journalistic writing, memoirs and literary criticism. Chernobyl has become, in fact, in the Ukraine, one of the most beloved topics of popular culture, which seems a little macabre and, and, and strange, but it's confirmed by a multiplicity of secondary school works, childhood recle recollections, patriotic spiritual confessions, songs, and yes, even jokes dedicated to the accident. Um, I have to admit that the jokes about Chernobyl, uh, which are made by survivors, are pretty bleak. And I thought I had a dark sense of humour, but I think the Chernobyl jokes um, definitely uh, win the prize there. Um, I've put my two favourite ones up there. One, of course, a terrible pun because the core, the radioactive core of the reactor versus the core of the uh, But my favourite one is the one which I've quoted below, and it's a very popular one which reads, an American robot is on the roof for five minutes and then breaks down. The Japanese robot is on the roof for five minutes and then breaks down. The Russian robot is up there for two hours. Then a command comes in over the loudspeaker, Private Ivanov, in two hours you're welcome to come down and have a cigarette break. It doesn't get much darker than that. And, of course, referring to being on the roof was um, a reference to the robots they used to try and clean up the radioactive material that was on the roof of the reactor. Um, but because of the levels of radioactivity up there, um, the robots kept breaking down. And so human beings, of course, were used to do that work instead. In line with other apocalyptic crises, the Holocaust, for example, the mushroom clouds over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, 9-11, Chernobyl adopts a cultural memory associated with global catastrophe and also a literature obsessed with capturing that which seems most beyond representation. What's really interesting about this and really important is that Chernobyl has been heavily censored. In fact, a quote suggests there, in a Sakenko out how reporting information dealing with the accident was prohibited. Journalists and scholars, writers and poets were only allowed to repeat the official point of view and there was a complete factual blackout event. Now, this was meant to really important things. The first is that because of the censorship, the people who were in the areas affected by the nuclear accident weren't immediately what had happened. And so they were exposed to radioactive fallout for quite a long time after the event. The government didn't want to admit the extent of the disaster and so it allowed its citizens to carry on as normal for many days and even weeks afterwards. All information about nuclear disasters was removed from public access, including removing books and tearing pages out of encyclopedias from libraries about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So people weren't able to use history to learn from these events to understand what was happening to them or what might be occurring. And this is important because what was happening to them was also invisible. They couldn't see the radioactive fallout. They couldn't immediately feel it. And so it was really easy to deny what was happening. The liquidators, who were the people tasked with cleaning up the zone of exclusion, were forbidden to write home about their experiences or to keep notes about what was happening. We still don't really know how many people died as a result of Chernobyl. Official records list anything, any, any number between 30 and 54, while the UN estimates the number is much more like 200,000, with another predicted 93,000 deaths in the future. But of course, people talk, and silence couldn't be maintained forever. As witness testimonies and fictions began to circulate throughout Western media, depictions of Chernobyl helped to shape a social spectacle of nuclear phobia. This in part echoed the fear of the death tank that was associated with Japanese atomic bomb survivors, but it also exoticised the zone of exclusion by way of a really surreal and quite nightmarish imaginary. The effect of the transformation of the nuclear accident into cultural constructions um, through which it becomes not only real but also a virtual phenomena creates this symbolism that is quite haunting and evocative um, and, and also quite troubling, I think, too.
So what happened is the images of Chernobyl were aestheticized to draw the attention of viewers and players and readers um, to consume it as an event. There are computer games such as Stalker and Counter-Strike Chernobyl, which also fuel this morbid voyeurism that's associated with dark tourism, and they start to erode the facts, the historical facts of the real world through these very heightened replicas. So... To be fair, Chernobyl did offer quite an incredible range of images and it's easy to see why people are drawn to them. Even the photograph on the slide here is an, is an artifice, it's a, a construction, someone's put a gas mask on the, uh, the haunting toy doll there. Um, but there were some very real images and some very real occurrences that are incredibly vivid. So in reading witness testimonies, for example, there are accounts of farmers who wrapped their cows in cellophane to protect them from radiation, people drinking litres and litres of vodka because they believed it protected them from sickness. Apparently Stolichnaya is the best vodka for that. Um, and something that really touched my heart was that people left goodbye notes to their houses. So when the liquidators went in to clean up and to make sure that nobody was there, they'd find these notes on kitchen tables where families had thanked their homes and apologised to them for leaving them and for abandoning them. So you can see from my quote from one survivor there, they said that how bizarre it was that people were doing, creating these invented scenes because Chernobyl itself is already so unimaginable that artistically people wanted to heighten that and to make more and more of it. Now, because no one could see the radiation, as I mentioned, it was relatively easy to pretend that nothing was happening and to deny that hundreds of thousands of people were killed. The result of this censorship and denial was that the victims were never really acknowledged, still haven't been acknowledged, and few people were aware of the suffering that was caused by Chernobyl. And because of this, a lot of the poetry written by Chernobylites, which is the name for survivors of the disaster, really focused their anger um, on, on this silencing. The poetry is furious, um, it has such a, a bubbling sense of resentment in, in most of it, and they insist on making sure that people know what happened to them. A lot of this poetry also hasn't been translated into English, which I think is quite telling, and again makes it really hard to uncover these voices. But also, Alison, like, Alice, yes. Alison, if I could just interrupt, are you still sharing uh, your screen? Yes, is it dropped out? No, no, I, 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 it's not visible at the moment. Ah, oh, hang on. Let's have a look. Sorry. Oh, it sounds like we've got a bit of a lag in yes. the presentation. Oh, technology. Well, like, yes, yes, yes. How, is that better now? It's, yes, we can see it now. Oh, good. Um, yeah. Thank you. Sure where I got up. Sorry about that. Technology is um, a bit of a beast in these COVID. Yes, these COVID. I know. Um, so anyway, as I was saying, a lot of the poetry written by Chernobylites is, is activist poetry. It's a poetry of protest. It's resisting silence. It's resisting censorship. And Lyubov Sirota is one of um, the most well-known Chernobyl poets. Um, and, and she relies quite heavily on images of ghosts and haunting which I think makes sense given the ways in which these people were denied a voice, and as you can see from some examples of her poetry there. Um, something that's really interesting about Chernobyl poetry generally is that it really draws on the invisibility of the radioactive fallout as a trope, and many of the poets draw on imagery in which the real and the unreal collide in really disturbing and, un and ambiguous ways. The subject of Sirota's poems occupies a liminal positionality, for example, um, haunted by zombies, and survivors are presented as the living dead who exist in this suffocating in-between space that's both physical and otherworldly. Sarah Phillips has a bit to say about this. I won't read the quote out, but basically she talks about the fact that the radiation was so elusive and mysterious and unseen and unknown that Writers um, trying to convey this try to translate Chernobyl into very concrete and material terms to make it real and, and to make it something that people couldn't ignore. And so another tactic of Chernobyl poets has been to really concentrate on the horrors of the body 
And Mario Petrucci has written this incredible book called Heavy Water. And in Heavy Water, the poems there are based on a series of oral histories and oral testimonies. And he uses them to create these narratives of the individuals who suffered, including the first responders. Um, his poetry is often cited in activist campaigns fighting for nuclear disarmament because they so powerfully reveal what can happen when um, nuclear power goes wrong, essentially. One of the most graphic, and I, I won't read the poem to you because it is, um, yeah, it is quite horrific, but one of the most graphic is his rendering of the testimony of Ludmila Ignatenko. Um, her husband Vasya was a firefighter and one of the first to respond to the Chernobyl fire, the Chernobyl explosion. And if you've seen the HBO version, the television series, quite a lot of time is dedicated to the narrative of this couple. And I think their story, they were so young, they were so innocent, um, Ludmilla was pregnant, they, they knew so little about what was happening to them. It captures so much about Chernobyl as event more broadly. Um, the poem is quite interesting because it, it uses fragmentation and a lot of trauma poets do this. So poets writing about 9-11, poets writing about Hiroshima, poets writing about the Holocaust, they use fragmentation because it's the only way, well, it's regarded as the only way to break down something that was so terrible into a means of being understandable. So focusing on the bodily, focusing on the parts of the body specifically, um, and, and trying to objectify it. So trying to describe the material facts of what is occurring to individuals rather than dealing with the ineffable or the spiritual um, per se. These poems are so important because they do represent these interconnections between history and literature so neatly and so powerfully. And they use the grotesque to convey the nightmare of Chernobyl and the nightmare of trauma and what happened to its first responders. But one survivor has also commented that literature stepped back in the face of reality. And it's important to keep in mind how literary works often compensate to make up for what seems impossible to really represent. And in doing that, they can risk distorting historical fact. As I mentioned before, there's been so many films, video games, science fiction and fantasy novels emerging from Chernobyl, and all of them are guilty of creating images that invite um, consumers to objectify this period of history as something entertaining and as something that can be packaged up in attractive ways. And if you think, well, how on earth could you make Chernobyl attractive or something you'd want to be entertained by or consume, then... A very simple Google search on Etsy and Redbubble and, and even um, eBay shows that you can buy quite a lot of Chernobyl merchandise, including phone covers, uh, coasters, mugs, um, face masks, T-shirts. It's kind of horrific. Um, you can buy a snow globe of Chernobyl as well. And what's particularly awful is that when you shake that snow globe, it has ash that comes down and you can buy tins where they claim to include bits of earth from Chernobyl or samples from the air. Um, now, this seems really bleak and, and horrifying, but it, it's not unique. You can also take a tour of the zone of exclusion um, in Pripyat, much like you can visit the concentration camps in Poland, visit sites of disaster in Hiroshima, New York, and so on. Um, this is something that theorists of dark tourism have talked about quite a lot, and the way in which literature plays a really problematic role here because it can make historical events and historical trauma and tragedy seem really appealing because it creates a sense of mystery. You can see, I'm not sure if you can zoom in, but on one of the T-shirts, Chernobyl has been designed much like the Disney logo. So, you know, there's some pretty alarming um, connections there that are happening. And I have to admit, um, I've been a little bit guilty of this myself in the past. I... Don't own any Chernobyl merchandise, but um, Hiroshima has a Hello Kitty range of atomic bomb merchandise, and I may own some of that. And it just shows that if the aesthetic appeals, the worlds collide in some very uncomfortable ways. So to sum up, um, I think I've been talking for far too long now, but literature can be a really powerful way to give voice to those who have historically been silenced. Um, but it is a really complicated relationship. 
But I think the point that I would keep coming back to is that even though writers are thwarted by the fact that things such as Chernobyl are unrepresentable, if no one attempts to portray these tragic events, then they are forgotten and they are lost in history as well. And I'll leave you with one of Sorota's poems there, but I'll also remove the show to end the show and hopefully not sharing anymore. Hang on, let's turn this off. There we go. And apologies for the tech issues halfway. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Uh, I think you uh, really walked us through uh, not just the, the literature part of it, the, the poetry writing part of it. It was also how, like you said, something that is said to be not representable is actually made visible in a certain sense mm -hmm. to people who were not part of it and who could not even imagine the horror of it. So it, it, brings it brings it home to us in a very raw kind of a fashion. Uh, I think when you read poems written about such uh, disasters, and you also read the news related to such disasters, there is such a vast difference because uh, the, the news is just reportage. It just tells you what happened. And of course, the way news channels go about it these days, they do make it sensational <laughs> but, and dramatic. But then when you read uh, poetry as something that, uh, you know, that, that really conveys what happened, it, I think it really touches a nerve. It goes straight to your heart. And uh, I, I, I probably an essay would not be able to do that as a poem might. And, uh, and you so rightly pointed out that, that you know, the, the dangers of the commodification is so much there. Like, for instance, with Auschwitz and Dachau, like, uh, you know, it, it's become a tourist spot. I mean, you may go there and, and feel horrified about what happened, but it doesn't take away from the commercial aspect of the whole thing. Of course, Chernobyl is, uh, you know, too day, far too dangerous to be visited at the moment. But uh, there's no saying when that could be changed, uh, you know, cha changed into a tourist spot as well. Oh, you, so, you, actually, you can visit Chernobyl and and do a tour at the moment. Yes. Oh, yeah. oh, I didn't know that. But then yeah. uh, that would be, that would be too much of bravado, don't you think? I, I mean, I was uh, to actually. <laughs> It, it's horrifying well, okay. to think that you could go somewhere that is physically so dangerous to you. Um, Absolutely. And people do, that people do. And, and, and what's interesting is the way in which tourism takes over. And yes. you can look at yes. any monument for any disaster in the world and see people posing next to them as though it's, you know, a view of the ocean or the Eiffel Tower or something slightly, you know, more innocent. Um there was a right. really interesting project done a few years ago in Berlin, um, which has that incredible monument with the stones and you walk through the stones and, and they get taller and taller as you go in. Incredible representation of, of how the Holocaust evolved. But people were posing on the stones, they were doing yoga on them, they were, you know, being a little bit romantic on the stones and so an artist actually gathered all those pictures and superimposed them with photographs from the Holocaust itself and the suffering of the people there. Just to remind you that while you're doing your downward dog pose on, on, on this monument, this is what it represents. And, and, you know, to show you the kind of incredibly discomforting relationship between dark tourism, commercialism, the objectification of trauma and, um, and the history that it actually represents and stands behind it. Mm -hmm. Which brings me to another aspect of your presentation, which is the dark humor. And <laughs> uh, well, the, the thing is that uh, I think that is a defense mechanism, don't you think? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, but you know, when something becomes just too intolerable, it becomes so unbearable that uh, you, you practically seem to be losing your mind. The only way you can stay sane is to, is to joke about it. I agree. And, and I'm someone who... Yeah regularly resorts to terrible humour, dark humour, in order to cope, to cope with difficulty. And I think um, reading any of the oral histories of people who survived Chernobyl, um, it's really bleak. The jokes are really bleak and, and very raunchy as well. And I, I think, you know, there's a, a clear link between sex and death, but definitely it, it's 
how do you cope with something? And, and again, for them, that humour actually functions as a way of representing the unrepresentable. You know, humour mm-hmm. able to distill mm-hmm. something so horrific in very powerful and very evocative ways that mm-hmm. may make you laugh, but there's that moment of profound reflection afterwards about what that joke might symbolise as well. No, but then is there a line that one cannot cross? where humor is concerned. Uh, for instance, is it okay for survivors to, to make jokes about it, but not for people who are not part of it? Yeah. Oh, gosh, that's an ethical <laughs> an ethical question, isn't it? I mean, I would certainly suggest that is the case. I, I, think, I think that's survivor territory. I think there's an ownership over that experience that doesn't belong to anyone else. And, you know, we all know that famous quote as well about, there can be no poetry after Auschwitz, I'm paraphrasing badly, but this idea that representation yes, yes. belongs to the people who lived it um, mm. and visitors and um, onlookers have no right to represent, and I think that applies to dark humour as well as to any other literary format. Mm-hmm. For instance, somebody who's, uh, who survived Auschwitz uh, may, may make jokes about it, uh, extremely bleak and mm. extremely telling jokes, but I don't think anyone else should like I you agree. said it's, it's, <laughs> I agree yes absolutely. right because yes. if I've not been a part of it I have you know if I've not been part of that pain and the suffering and the bitterness and all of that I have no business uh, being a part of the the, the laughter bit of it yeah I mean that, the laughter of course is not pure laughter it it, it has a lot of pain right I agree it's, it's it, a it, way it, of expressing that pain yeah it, it belongs to the people who survived it. Yes, yes. Mm. Thank you so much, Alison. And uh, I, I noticed I, I noticed that we've been getting a lot of comments, and uh, but I'm I'm unable to access it at the moment. But uh, a lot of them have been, you know, both for you and David, saying that 